Well, I'm Christina Ott, and I'm a natural builder. I do some custom building work, but mostly what I do is teach owner builders how to build their own homes, and also garden structures, pizza ovens, smaller projects like that. And so I'm going to do a short slideshow, and I'm just going to talk about a little bit about the history of natural building, or specifically of cob, which is the material I work with and what it is, and some different examples of it. Um, and then I'll take questions at the end. This is not a cob building, but it is what most people think of when you tell them about cob. They say, oh, I'm an African mud hut, and I, you know, I don't want to live like that, or that's fine for, you know, an, it's an interesting experience, but it's not a real house. And this actually is not cob, although it looks a little bit like some cob buildings. It does represent a different approach to building, though, because all of these people in the village have helped each other build the houses there. And it's, it's very cooperative. Everything used in the buildings came from within a walking distance of where they were built. Everything's local, natural. And the people have intentionally built their houses very close together because they're quite inter interdependent. They're not looking for a place where they can't see the neighbors and the neighbors can't see them. Um, so it does show a little bit of a different approach to housing, which we often find valued a lot more in natural building than in conventional building. This is a cob building, and it is just made of solid sand, clay, and straw walls. It's probably about a thousand years old, and this is in Yemen. Now, whole, the whole city there is built out of cob. All these huge palaces, public buildings, it's all just natural mud and straw. And then the white detailing is a, a lime wash. So you can see it, it is a very simple material, but it can achieve great things. This is the form of cob building that most people are familiar with, although you may have never known it was cob. You see these all over England and Western Europe, and it is the traditional English cottage. It's a cob building, and the date plate on this one reads 1539. There are quite a few of these in England. This is one that's been restored. In fact, there are about 600,000 of them, and they bring a much higher price on the real estate market than conventional buildings of the same size. People really like these. They're much more energy efficient, and they're beautiful. They have a, a very different feel to them that it's kind of hard to grasp until you're actually in one. Um, but as you can see, there are whole neighborhoods of them, and they look quite conventional. Um, we're going to see a range of different styles of cob because in this country we've started to develop some really, really wild looking buildings. It gives you a lot of creative freedom. But this very traditional look is also possible with cob. This is a cob building in New Zealand. It was built around 1800, already a little bit of a different look. It's been through five earthquakes that leveled everything around it. Because cob is monolithic, there's no, it's not, we're not talking about adobe block. The whole wall is built in place. There's no seam for it to crack on. So in an earthquake, the whole house moves. It's just a single brick, the entire building. In this country, there's been a real renaissance of cob in the last 15 or 20 years. It had been sort of a forgotten method um, for just about a generation, just long enough for all the old craftspeople to die off. And now people are start starting to revive it and learning about the old ways of building. And the reason that it's become so popular is because it's very simple. It's something anyone can do. And so the new cob buildings in this country are almost entirely owner-built homes. There are a few contractors doing it, but mostly it's people like this woman. She was 72 years old, and she had always wanted to build her own house. And she realized that she, if she was going to build, she'd better do it while she was still young enough. So she took a cob workshop, and she built the house behind her entirely by herself. Um, and it's, it's just that simple. It's actually a very beautiful house, too. I don't have an interior photo of it, but it's very, it has that unique quality that Cobb gives. This is a Cobb cottage on Main Island. That's the building permit you can see taped in the window. There are quite a few load-bearing Cobb-walled buildings um, permitted in BC, in British Columbia. And there are several in this country too. And this is the inside of it. You can see that the, the walls curve in a really unique way. And Cobb gives you 
the ability to do things like these archways very simply, much easier than it would be to do that with drywall and stud framing. And also the stairs, are the treads are sticking directly into the wall. And that's really the only thing holding them up. They put um, those other sticks on the other side of them for the building inspection, but then they took them off later because the stairs are really just supported by the wall. It's a cantilevered staircase. And this building has a living room and a kitchen and a breakfast area and an entryway and a bathroom, and then upstairs there's a loft and an office. And the roofs are living roofs, so from the upstairs loft you can walk out onto a grassy lawn that is the deck, basically. And it's very tiny. It, this is less than 500 square feet, but it has all that in it, and it feels quite large. And this is another Cobb building that was done entirely during workshops. It was built totally by people who had never built anything before. And what I really like about this picture is it shows the unique quality of light you get through those deep window reveals. Uh, but it also shows some of the detailing that's so easy to put in with the relief work in the plaster. And you can see the underside of the roof. This is a living roof on top, so what you're seeing in this part of the picture is actually the structure of the roof. It's not a decorative ceiling. And those round poles are the rafters. They're just sitting directly on the cob and the cob just comes right up under the roof sheathing. Now this was built by someone who had taken five-day workshop and then he worked on this building for about 18 months over the course of seven years. We just met him recently. He actually works in Asheville now as a natural builder. But um, what I like about it is that it shows a great deal of attention to detail. He really took his time with this building. It was done largely during workshops. And you can see there's all these little nooks everywhere, and there are bottles embedded in the walls for light. You get sort of a stained glass look from that. But everywhere you turn in that house, when you go to, say, light the fire in the wood stove, and where you would just naturally go to put the box of matches down, there's a little matchbook size hole in the wall to stick them in. And throughout the house, it was really planned very well that way. This is the kitchen of the same house, looking from the living room into the kitchen. And there's a little slanted door here on the wall, which is a compost chute. It's a big piece of PVC pipe that goes through the wall at an angle, because these are just solid earthen walls that can be built right around the pipe. And it shoots right into the compost pile, so you just stick the compost in the chute and it flies right through the wall and lands in the compost. Also, the stairs in this, um, they're very narrow. It functions both as a staircase and a dividing wall from the entryway to the living room. But they're slices off of a log that was two trees that had grown together. So at the bottom of the staircase, you see very separate tree rings. But as you go up, they start to merge. And on the top tread, the tree rings have formed this perfect heart. And that's really the soul of Cobb buildings, is that when they're built by owners, the owners do things that you could never convey to your builder to do. Um, and you might not even think of until you're sitting in your house half built and wondering what to do next. You can also see the handprint of um, the woman's grandchild there in the wall. And this is some more of that same house. It has a kitchen, which you saw was very nice, and a living room. And it has an upstairs bedroom with a walk-in closet, and then decks that are living roofs. And the whole thing is about 300 square feet. So this is a tiny little cottage. And it looks tiny from the outside, but inside there's actually a, a queen-size bed and a desk and a spot to do yoga. And it's just a little garden guest house. And this is a, an office in one of the Cobb homes that's had a desk cut to fit the curve of the wall. And it has some really nice plaster relief work in it. This woman took a workshop in the United States and then went back to South Africa where she lives and built this house. And she did all her furniture out of cob, built-in benches for a couch. She has a cob fireplace which also works as an oven for baking bread. And she even did her countertops and her sink out of cob, which is very unusual because cob is it's essentially adobe. It's a dried mud. You wouldn't think of it as a, a countertop surface sort of material. But she sealed it with linseed oil and beeswax, and it has held up very well. It's perfectly waterproof. So this building shows a little bit of a different look. You can, you can look very traditional, but you certainly don't have to with Cobb. You can make it look like anything you want. 
And this one is a yoga studio. And it's self-explanatory. It's just very funky. So people often ask me, what, a, what does a cob building look like? And there's really no, no straight answer for that question. Now, in Portland, Oregon, they've been doing quite a bit of cob work in the city. There's, been, there's a grassroots organization called City Repair. They do projects like this right in downtown Portland to sort of create public space in public spaces, but places where people usually just walk through, intersections and warehouse districts. And they do cob benches and sort of places, tea houses, you can sit down and visit with people and socialize. And they do that so that there's a being in place instead of a going through place. And they're done in open workshops, so anyone who walks by on the street can jump in and participate in the building. This is a warehouse front, and that's a, a distant view of it. It was done, it was, you know, previously just a metal warehouse building. It was very ugly, and so, certainly no one would sit down and chat with their neighbors there. But they put in all these benches in the roots of the trees, and the cob walls. And this is another of those benches. It's built at an intersection where a bicyclist was killed by a car. And this is what started this project. They decided to memorialize the bicyclist by doing a cob kiosk there, but also to try and prevent that problem from happening again in the future. So they painted the intersection with all kinds of different colors and made basically a mandala in it. And then they put a little cub structure on each corner, a bench on one, and a tea station, a playhouse for kids, and a book exchange on the fourth corner. And now, when you go there, people walk around in the middle of that intersection and treat it like a public lawn. And the cars come up, they come up real fast, but when they get within sight of it, they slow down and they go around it like a roundabout, even though it's not. And it's just the, the visual change, so it really made a place that people like to hang out instead of a place people are afraid to walk through. This is a Cobb Elementary School, also in Portland. And those are the cubbies, and these are bottles in the wall. One of the reasons I'm showing all these pictures of Portland is it's a really good use of Cobb in an urban setting and for the public good, but it also shows building codes starting to accept it a great deal more. Portland's a pretty big city, and they allow cob structures right in all their neighborhoods now, just because some people decided they wanted to build with it and went and talked to the city council. And this is another of the benches. This is a poetry exchange. There's a mailbox in it, and you can leave poems there for people to read. And a garden shed. This is um, an oven and fireplace that's shaped like a bulb of garlic. This is in Seattle, Washington. It's in a city garden plot. It's called the City Farmer Group. So this is a picture of a workshop that I taught in Tallahassee, Florida. And you can see the, the process of Cobb in the, these pictures. We have sand and clay and tarps, and we've built a stem wall to put the cob wall on. Because cob can't sit directly on the ground, it's very porous and it can absorb moisture from the ground. So you need a stem wall, usually stone, although in Florida we have no stone, so we use concrete, broken up concrete slab, which looks pretty good. It ends up looking a lot like granite, and it's a reused material that would otherwise go into a landfill. And this is how you make it. That's what the walls are made out of. You just dance in it with your feet. And anybody can do this. It's a great thing for kids because you can't wear them out. And who doesn't like to play in the mud? Most adults really, really enjoy this, too. People loosen up a lot when they get on a cob building site because it's, it's quite a bit of fun. It's not like a conventional construction site. And these are workshop participants learning to build a cob wall. This, you see the pile of cob there and then people sewing it into the wall. Now this is my first cob building that I ever did. I had taken only a five-day workshop at this point, and I came home very excited about it and asked my parents if I could use their backyard to try out my newfound skills with natural building. And they had a shed they didn't want anymore. It was wooden, so it had rotted. And 
I tore that down and built this building in its place. And this, this was just with, you know, fa basically five days of training. I'd never built anything before. So there we are mixing cob and tossing cobs to the wall. And when it was almost finished. And then that's the, the finished building. Now this is only about a mile from the Gulf Coast, from the coast there. It's in Pensacola, Florida. And you may know that Pensacola was hit by a couple of pretty devastating hurricanes in the last few years. The neighborhood this was in wasn't hit as badly as most. Most of the trees came down and the roofs were all gone. But a block away, the houses were being bulldozed because they had been lifted off their foundations by the wind. Um, so this building got a, a pretty good test. And in fact, it had an oak tree that fell directly on it. It hit it right over the doorway, which is really the weakest point of the building. And the oak tree was about that big around, it was very heavy. And you can see it there sitting on the building. You can just barely see the roof peeking through. It took us about two days to chainsaw this tree off so we could see what damage it had done. And when we finally got through, we found that. It broke one purlin in the eave, and it tore up some of the steel roofing. But when it hit the cob, it stopped. Now, if a tree like that had fallen on a conventional building, of course, it would have just sliced it in half. So a lot of the neighbors who had said, oh, that'll wash away in the first hard rain, that's ridiculous, we live in a wet area, maybe you could do that in the southwest, but not here. Well, now they're saying, next time I'm going to ride out the storm in your shed. And that's just a close-up of the plaster on the building. This was done all with the, just the native red clay, which actually, I don't think you have the same clay here, but in North Georgia and on down, you get this very sandy red clay, and it's a perfect ready-mix cob. All you have to do is add water, and you get these very hard earthen walls. So these are some of the interior details. This is just a square window, like in an old aluminum frame, that I embedded in the cob. I didn't have to cut the glass to be an arch. I just built the cob around it, so I only revealed the arched part of the glass. This is a chapel that we did in Texas on a, a very large private ranch. It's a straw bale cob combination. And you see some framing there, but that's the posts are temporary. They're just to hold up the roof while we build the walls. And then the posts come out, and the roof sits down on the walls. Now this one is a building that had been, basically the property had been flattened by a hurricane. And the people didn't have any insurance, so they picked up the scraps and put this shack back together, and that's what they were living in. They certainly weren't very comfortable. They spent a winter in there. And in northwest Florida, it does get very cold. Um, not for long, but it does get cold. And so they, had, they basically said, never again, we want to be warm. And so they hosted a cob workshop, and we replaced their shack walls with cob walls. So this is after a five-day workshop. And it's not completely finished. You can see the straw still sticking out because we haven't plastered it. But it's done entirely out of hurricane debris and the soil from just a couple of miles away. The foundation is broken up pieces of slab. And we found a little bit of flagstone, too, that had been torn up. All the wood was hurricane salvage, all the windows. So this building cost them virtually nothing in materials. And it's still a very small, very simple little home, but it's a big step up from where they were. And these are the people who built it. It was actually almost all children in that workshop. There were two mothers and a whole bunch of homeschooled kids. And this is another view of the same building before and then after we did the cob. Now the purpose of a foundation under a cob wall is to keep moisture from wicking up and to keep the building from settling because it's extremely heavy um, and to provide drainage. So you really want something that's pretty impervious to water, a stone, concrete, something like that. This is one we did in South Georgia in Moultrie. And the owner of this house was actually an architect. And he had done his thesis on natural building. And then he got really excited about it. So he hired us to um, work a little bit on a cob house. And he designed it. He was really attached to a very traditional look. He wanted it very square. Um, so we did a workshop, and we built most of the cob walls. They hired us to do the roof, and he did the foundation himself. You can see it, um, 
it's got quite a bit of versatility. The second floor on this building is going to be board and bat and siding and conventionally done, but the whole thing rests on the cob walls. We put it up again on temporary posts. When the walls reach this first beam here, we'll take out the post and the whole second story will sit down on those cob walls. Now most people um, don't want to jump right into building a house for the first project. It's a good idea not to. There's a lot of smaller projects you can do. And benches are one of the really popular ones. This is a bench in Portland, Oregon. And it shows some of the sculptural work you can do with Cobb. It's really tremendously versatile. It's also a great project to do with kids or you know, with community groups. And this is in front of a food co-op in Portland. And this is a Cobb restaurant in Oregon. Um, that's just some of the seating. And then there's a long view of the restaurant. They were, the restaurant was sited between a huge asphalt parking lot, which was a heat island, it was very ugly, and then on the other side they had a freeway. And it was really bad atmosphere and they weren't doing very good business because nobody wanted to sit there and eat and watch the cars that buy on the freeway. So they, had, they got a permit to build a Cobb addition to the, the restaurant. And the way they did it was they built a garden wall, a courtyard, and then they put a canvas roof over it, which is semi-permanent. Um, and it makes a really nice sort of arboretum feeling. But because the roof is cloth, the code considered it a tent and they didn't, regardless of what the walls are or how deep the foundation goes, it was still a tent and they didn't need a permit to do it. They do all the cooking for this restaurant in that cob oven. And it's the best food you've ever had. It's wonderful. There's some traditional cob ovens. Now these are really good starter projects too. It only takes about a day to build one. And it's a very, it's very formulaic. It's really easy to do. You just sort of follow the step-by-step -step instructions. This one um, is also in Florida and it went through the hurricanes. Now you're supposed to put a roof over any cob building. It, it doesn't melt in the rain, it doesn't soften up and collapse, but it slowly erodes. The plaster comes off from just the erosion factor, really. So over, they, they'll last about six years before you start to see serious damage if you don't protect a cob building. And this one was in Florida for about two years with no roof over it. And then it got hit by the hurricane and a wheelbarrow flew through the air and slammed into the side of it. And it just kind of chipped the plaster, but it really didn't hurt the the oven at all. These walls are only about four inches thick, so you would think they would be drenched and soft and the whole thing would collapse with an impact like that. But it really wasn't so. And part of that is because it has a lime plaster on it, which is sort of a natural alternative to stucco. We can't use stucco with cob, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Here's some more projects. This is a courtyard with a cob oven and fireplace. And this one comes off of a cob house. It's actually a really nice cob house. But you can see you can make, it's very popular to make cob ovens in the shapes of animals for some reason. Could you talk more about building permits in this area? I don't know about um, North Carolina specifically, but I know there are quite a few cob buildings here and that at least some of them have been, been permitted. The International Building Code has a section on Adobe, and I was actually working for a building inspector in Middle Tennessee, where I live, and he said, you know, that you could build a Cobb house right in downtown, right here, no problem. He would approve it, um, because it's in the code, and it, it's perfectly legal. They do require a cement stucco is the only problem, um, and I think that they'll figure that out pretty soon. But um, you have to do a concrete bond beam on the top of the wall and you need, there's very specific about the foundation, but other than that it's, it's quite acceptable. You usually have to work with the building official a little bit because it's unfamiliar and they don't want to be responsible if it doesn't work. But what a lot of people have done is taken in books on Cobb Building and just asked the building department to 
read them, whoever the inspector is, and really make them your partner because usually they're very cooperative actually and a lot of building inspectors get pretty excited about it and even want to come help and learn how to do it. So it, it definitely can be done but there's sometimes you have to set the precedent and so there's, you have to jump through a few more hoops. One of the main differences I think when you work with rounded spaces you don't get the dead space in corners and you get just, you know, the size of a building has nothing to do with numbers. Space is not a number, it's not square footage and it really, it's a psychological experience. It has to do with light, it has to do with shapes and function, but it has nothing to do with a number of square feet or anything like that. And so when we talk about Cobb buildings, we don't talk about square feet. Sometimes we joke about round feet. But mostly we just try to talk about space because your concept of how big 80 square feet is or 2,000 square feet from what you've experienced in conventional buildings just won't apply. To
I'm Christina Ott and I am a natural builder. I teach workshops for people who want to learn to build their own cob homes. We have 150 acres in Middle Tennessee, which we just started. And we teach everything from one day earthen ovens to weekend classes, which are just an introduction to the wall building. We don't get into all the other things that are involved, but just how to make the mud and build the wall. And then we do everything up to a 10-day owner-builder course, which teaches you foundations to roofs, plumbing, electricity, everything. And in just a few minutes, we're going to have reached the height where we want to put a window in. On This is a framed, operable window. You can see we've put in the wooden frame. Uh, yeah, first time I come, I'm a sort of carpenter, handyman kind, trying to check out alternative building techniques. Really? Really digging it. Oh, that's I can have more confidence in building my own cob structure. It was exactly what I was looking for.